Hello and welcome to this week's Glass Tower Top 5. It is the week of December 20th, 2018. I'm Christina Reese. I'm Neil Farso. And this is a, this is a, a holiday list. This is uh, the top five unconventional Christmas movies that you can watch. So instead of going to all of your standbys, It's a Wonderful Life, Christmas Story, the original animated Grinch, some mm-hmm. of my favorite Christmas movies, but there are some movies that take place during Christmas time where Christmas is kind of the backdrop. It makes things a little bit maybe more charged in some ways. Uh, they're not necessarily feel good movies. They're not about. They're not about Christmas. They just have Christmas, and that, so it kind of keeps you in the mood. Yeah, exactly. I mean, all these movies have uh, significant Christmas aesthetics, so I consider them to be fully in the Christmas movie category. When a list like this comes up, everyone says Die Hard, people say Trading Mm -hmm. Places. We know, you know, we're aware of this. We're just going to throw out a few other things that you may not have thought of. The number five is going to be Gremlins, Joe Dante's great movie from 1984, which has aged great, and the sequel is also really good as well. And it has one of my favorite lazy 80s movies tropes, which is where a guy goes to Chinatown to buy something twisted, and then that essentially is the entire movie. So Hellraiser is another movie that does that. Big Trouble in Little China. There's a lot of movies where just going to Chinatown is the Deo Ex Machina for the film, and then kind of, you know, create opens his Pandora's box. In this case, the guy buys a gremlin, a little monster called Magwai, which is devil on Cantonese from a Chinese a uh, man in Chinatown who warns him that he's not ready for the uh, responsibility of having a little gremlin, and he's totally not. And so during the Christmas season, most of the rest of the movie takes place in a suburban town and just is mainly the gremlins wreaking havoc through the town during Christmas time, which if you spend any time in a mall or pretty much anything during Christmas time and kind of have that experience where you're like, God, this sucks. Gremlins is a very cathartic and fun experience, and uh, I recommend rewatching it. All right, so number four on our list is In Bruges, which is a 2008. It's a black comedy by Martin McDonough, and it, it was sort of it marks the the comeback to some degree of Colin Farrell, who had gone a little bit he'd gone away after going to rehab and sort of after the whole Miami Vice debacle and. You know, when he was at the height of his drug and alcohol use, he went away, went to rehab, got cleaned up, and this was sort of his comeback. It's a very good movie, by the way, and I would say that despite the fact that it's violent and it's about two Irish hitmen uh, in hiding in Bruges, um, it's funny, and it's during Christmas time, and Bruges is one of these places, is one of these medieval European cities that's supposed to be a good city to visit for Christmas time if you're a tourist. I just, I remember seeing it when it came out and just sort of uh, being surprised by it. Like every 15 or 20 minutes, something about it surprised me in a good way. It definitely does begin, marks the beginning of kind of Colin Farrell's renaissance that started with that movie and has continued till now, like since he went to rehab, got sober, he made kind of a decision in his life to really pretty much only act in interesting things. and. He's really quite an interesting actor now. Brendan Gleeson's a great actor, too. He's great in it, and they have really great interplay. Number three is Batman Returns, which is by far my favorite Batman movie. And it's a situation that I love whenever it happens, where a weird director has an enormous success. In this case, the first Batman was a huge movie, one of the biggest movies of all time, made a fortune. Okay, so Tim Burton did the first one. And, and this one. one. He kind of was given carte blanche to do whatever he wanted, and he made Batman Returns, which caused him to basically exit the franchise because it was so dark and it was so weird. It freaked a lot of parents out. It was mainly focused on the villains who were played by Danny DeVito as the Penguin, Michelle Pfeiffer as Catwoman, and then there's a new villain played by Christopher Walken called Max Shrek, who's like an evil businessman. But it's visually amazing. It's kind of like this psychotic... Christmas carnival uh, aesthetic that I really like, even more so than the sort of gothic aesthetic of Batman 1. And there's a great part at the beginning of Batman Returns as well where it's kind of the origin story of the Penguin, where Paul Rubens of uh, Pee-wee's Big Adventure fame is like a sort of rich uh, patrician in early New York, and they give birth to basically a penguin baby that they put into the river and then it becomes a penguin, but it's a great sequence. Uh, The penguin is kind of a Trump-like character because he runs for office in it as sort of a faux populist, even though he's kind of a rich patrician and he's he's really gross, you know, like 
but he's kind of strangely popular, so it's sort of a prescient movie in a lot of ways. Number two on our list is one of my favorite movies of all time. It's L.A. Confidential. It was released in 1997. Uh, Curtis Hansen was the director who just died two years ago. James Elroy wrote the novel in 1990 that it's based on. It's set in 1950s Los Angeles. It's a crime movie. And the detectives are investigating something called, I think, the Bloody Christmas Case or something mm-hmm. like that. And it, and, it, and they're they're investigating a, t- a case, a murder that took place over Christmas. It also takes place during Christmas. A wonderful cast. It's Russell Crowe, Guy Pearce, uh, James Cromwell is in it, Kim Basinger is great in it. Uh, Russell Crowe is wonderful in this movie. It's a very complex movie, but it's not confusing, you know, and oh. it's very gripping, and it's just, it's amazing. I mean, I, when that movie came out, I think I saw it four times in the theater. It's just one of those great movies made by a studio system where everything is extremely high level and everything is really sophisticated. It's definitely the best movie of 1997. Oh, uh, and, it lost the, and it lost the Oscar to Titanic, which is just yeah. still one of those things that sort of chaps me, but um, yeah, but these things happen. Number one is Stanley Kubrick's Eyes Wide Shut which is 100% a Christmas movie. Literally, there are Christmas lights in every single scene in the movie, and they're filmed with this kind of beautiful, diffuse glow. It is also in contrast to, he creates this really surreal blue light that comes in through windows and doorways that I've never really seen in a movie before. So the light palette in Eyes Wide Shut is really incredible and warm. And when Eyes Wide Shut came out, you know, it got... Middling reviews. I remember seeing it. I was extremely excited about it, and I was kind of baffled by it. I found it to be sort of boring and still did. But over time, it's aged really well, and I'm coming back to it, I've come to realize that, number one, it's definitely supposed to be kind of a droll comedy in a certain way. There's a lot of very funny things in it that I missed the first time that are clearly supposed to be a joke. Like, for example, Tom Cruise's character is a doctor, and throughout the entire movie, any time... He wants to establish his bona fides with anyone, no matter who it is. He's like, I'm a doctor, and he pulls out his state board medical card, and it's like this really absurd gag that keeps going. You know, there's, like, a lot of Stanley Kubrick's movies, The Shining, which there's a documentary about all the people that have studied, you know, just the various riddles and labyrinthine details in The Shining. Eyes Wide Shut is exactly the same way. There is so much in there, and there's so many kind of clues and interesting mazes and pathways that you can take. For example, where the orgy scene is at is at a um, the Rothschild estate that the famous surreal Rothschild ball was from the 70s, so obviously there's some echoes with that. The mask that Tom Cruise wears during the orgy was actually made for Ryan O'Neill during the fa- filming of Barry Lyndon. It's really a great movie, and it's going to be screening in early January at AFS in Austin. I saw it this past weekend at the Alamo Draft House in Austin, so I recommend seeing it in the theater if you can. It's a quite a beautiful experience, and uh, it's my favorite Christmas movie. 